Ready? On December 12th, Oklahoma City voter voters will go to the polls to answer one question. Will they agree to build a new downtown arena? If the answer is yes, the Thunder has agreed to sign a 25-year lease to play in the new facility. Oklahoma City would also have an arena more capable of drawing the biggest concerts, shows, and acts. But if the answer is no, the future of the NBA and OKC is uncertain at best, and at worst, Oklahoma City could lose the Thunder. Today, Sellout Crowd is excited to bring together a distinguished panel to discuss the new arena proposal and what the December 12th vote could mean for Oklahoma City. My name is Jenny Carlson, columnist with Sellout Crowd, and we are live from the First National Center in downtown Oklahoma City. We're joined by Oklahoma City Mayor David Holt. He was first elected in 2018, becoming the youngest mayor of a U.S. city of more than 500,000 residents and was re-elected in 2022. He's the architect of the arena proposal going in front of voters. Also joining us is Dr. Russell Evans, an economist who holds bachelor's and master's degrees from Oklahoma State. He specializes in regional economic forecasting and has done research on everything from the Oklahoma oil and gas sector to the fiscal impact of the thunder. Lastly, and certainly not least, we're joined by John Hamm. He covers the Thunder and the NBA for Sellout Crowd. His biggest expertise is on the business side of the league, including the always intriguing collective bargaining agreement, which is all true except for the intriguing part of the collective bargaining <laughs> agreement. Thanks to all of you for joining us today for this discussion. Let's start with you, Mr. Mayor. Make your elevator pitch. <laughs> And it's okay if the building's really tall. I understand it may not be a 30-second pitch. But what is your pitch to voters as they prepare to go to the polls on December 12th? Well, this is this can be a really complex issue. But I'm going to start with, with maybe the uh, first national elevator pitch, and then we'll move to the Devon Tower okay. elevator pitch, right? So, you know, at its core, and you kind of said this in the intro, it's really a pretty simple choice on Tuesday, December 12th, the week from today as we're sitting here. And the choice is, do you want to have an NBA team or not. And also maybe supplementary to that, do you want to have great concerts and great shows or not? Um, those things begin to slowly slip away, maybe not so slowly in some cases, if we vote no. Um, we know the, the add-on benefits to this, and Russell can speak to it, and some are tangible and some are harder for economists to wrap their arms around. But we all kind of know implicitly what this city is like today versus what it was like before the NBA arrived. And we as a community also know how important the other uses of the arena are because we've been building arenas for 100 years, which I think is also really important to point out. It's like, you know, this isn't like we're just doing this for the Thunder. We were doing this for 85 years before the Thunder arrived. Now, the longer thing is, you know, uh, the longer speech, I suppose, is people I don't I fear sometimes they don't always understand the urgency and the stakes. And one of the most complicated things about this endeavor over the last two years is I've had to kind of like try to coach up an entire city into being like sports business experts on the level of John, you know? <laughs> because understandably, they, they want to know a little bit more. They don't just want to take it at face value. And when, when we get into that level of conversation, I have to kind of step back from my cheerleader role because nobody is more of a proponent of Oklahoma City than me. Nobody likes to brag more that we're the 20th largest city than me. But the reality is what matters to the NBA and most businesses is what market size you are. And we're the 42nd largest market. And really nobody outside of Oklahoma City thinks we should have this team. And I see that every day. We kind of like, I think, sometimes get into a very understandable and in some ways admirable uh, cocoon here in Oklahoma City where we think we can like drive a hard bargain or <laughs> or you know um, expect that sports teams are just clamoring to be in Oklahoma City it was like kind of a miracle that we got this team in the first place and I believe it will be kind of a second miracle if we keep the team yeah. I believe we will but it is we are up the deck is stacked against us and um, and that's why we have to do this yeah. and it's also why we kind of have to do it on a certain timeline because their lease has already expired and they basically just agreed to a longer lease just to have this vote yeah. so the stakes are really high the urgency is really high um, but but there's so many other things that you know are important to this the concerts the economic impact the quality of life uh, the philanthropy that comes with the team, and just the, kind of the way we see ourselves and the way the world sees us, which has completely changed since 2008. 
All of that is on the line because it really defines our status as a city. And that's why the slogan is what it is. The slogan's not keep the thunder, the slogan's not let's build an arena, the slogan is let's keep OKC big league. Yeah. Because that's the upper tier of American cities, that's where we arrived in 2008, and all of that is threatened if we vote no, but all of that is secured for a generation without raising taxes if we vote yes. And I think if you keep it to that simple message at the end of the day, it's a no-brainer. Well, Dr. Evans, let's talk about the fiscal side of things here for a second. Fiscal impact of the Thunder, area of expertise of yours. This is a continuation, as the mayor mentioned, continuation of that one cent sales tax to build this downtown arena. But what are the fiscal benefits of doing this? I mean, obviously there's that tax that people are paying out, but what are they going to get in return? Yeah. So I think, you know, when the, the mayor alluded to this, I think, when I think about this vote, I think we, we might be the most informed electorate to ever face like this kind of vote, right? I think anybody who's been in Oklahoma City for a long period of time remembers what it was like in 1993, right? When we got the initial maps, you know, passage. There really, we were a city that was really sort of devoid of any quality of life amenities. Um, and we were kind of grappling with that reality that, that our, our business base was leaving, that we were having our time attracting people. And we sort of grappling with this reality that we don't offer a lot in terms of quality of life amenities. When you think about a professional's franchise, especially for a market our size with only one franchise, you really, I sort of think about the Thunder as part private entity and part uh, public quality of life amenity. And so we have this experience, we have these observations where we know what it was like to sort of not have an amenity package. And then we pass MAPS, and we know what it's like to pay the MAPS tax, right? I, I know what that one cent sales tax feels like for me and my family. I don't like paying it, but I don't like paying any taxes, right? But I, I sort of know what it feels like. And we had this period where we had a team here temporarily, and then we didn't have a team, and then we have a team here permanently, and now we have sort of an, an opportunity to retain them. And so when I really think about the impact, I really think about the dynamic impact, right? I, we sort of, we've experienced this whole, we've experienced every element of what we're about to vote. We have to be among the most informed electorate ever. And I think sometimes when we sort of argue around uh, some of the economic impact numbers and some of the dollars, I think we're missing the bigger point of what a franchise or what, what the Thunder have meant to us in terms of the development of an urban quality of life complex, anchoring an urban quality of life complex that has allowed sort of the development you know, around the arena. So the impacts are significant, but I think the impacts are, I think the dynamic impacts, the growth impacts, the contributions to your perception, your quality of life amenities is as valuable. It's the side the mayor said was more difficult to value, put a dollar value on, but I think it's as valuable as the, the foot traffic that comes in for concerts and the foot traffic that comes through on a game night. And, and certainly be happy to talk about that impact a little bit more you know, later on, but I would really frame it that way, really thinking about the contribution to your quality of life amenity base and having experienced the with, the without, the with, the without, we kind of know, right, we should be a pretty informed electorate at this point. Yeah, that's a great point. John, you've watched the NBA for a long time. You've seen cities say yes to arenas. Mm. You've seen cities say no to the arenas. What does history tell us about cities that have boats like we're about to face? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, I know Milwaukee is one that comes to mind where, I mean, there was healthy debate over whether you know they should go forward with that. Ultimately, they did. Uh, and that turned out to be very beneficial to them because the Bucks wound up winning the national, uh, mm -hmm. uh, national championship. Yeah. Not saying that that's going to duplicate here, though that would be wonderful. Um, <laughs> would anybody argue with that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, and so like, I, I, do, I do see that. Um, and sometimes it does lead to a team having to relocate. Now, since 1984, there have been teams relocate. Uh, six of them. Now, one of them was, you know, Newark, New Jersey to Brooklyn. It barely counts. It's like 15 <laughs> miles away. But, um, you know, in four of those instances, the NBA did not come back. Now, granted, we're talking about San Diego. We're talking about Seattle, uh, Kansas City. Um, you know, Charlotte got another team. That's a whole complicated story. But, you know, uh, typically, you know, the, the teams leave, and even though that those cities have other pro sports teams, the NBA has not come back yet. Seattle's on the list, um, but that, that's the sort of thing you have to, I think, be, be cognizant of when you, when you look at this. Well, and I think the question of if Oklahoma City doesn't have a team, is it naturally at the top of an expansion list? And I don't know no. if it would be. <laughs> no. We wouldn't have an arena. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That too. <laughs> and, you know, and again, that's the reality. The NBA right now, it's different. You know, 20 years, 20, 30 years ago was Toronto, Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver no longer has a team. Um, and since then, now, we, you know, the NBA wants to get back into Seattle. They want to get to Las Vegas. 
years. They've talked about Mexico City. Um, they've talked about expanding outside of the United States. So, um, you know, I, I feel like Oklahoma City, Mayor Holt alluded to this, a lot of factors, you know, worked in the favor here to get a team here. And I'm not so certain the Lightning could strike twice. Yeah. You know, Mr. Mayor, you came on my show uh, a month or so ago. Mm -hmm. We talked about the blowback of what the Thunder is paying. That's probably been the biggest factor. Mm -hmm. If people are saying, I'm against this, it's what the team has put in, $50 million of a $900 million project. Um, what, what should voters know about that piece sure. of this puzzle? Sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, multiple layers to this, but the first is, it's $50 million more than we've ever received for our arenas <laughs> in the past. So it's like, you know, I, I'm grateful from that regards. You know, we, we, I've heard people say um, uh, in the last few weeks, you know, well, no, no arena has ever had this much percentage of public investment. I'm like, how about the one we're currently playing in? <laughs> it was 100% public investment. And, and the reality is there are multiple arenas in the NBA that were 100% public investment. And guess what? They're all kind of our peer cities. They're the, our, they're the cities that are the similar size as us. Memphis and New Orleans got nothing for their arenas. Um, Yes, other cities got more of a donation, you know, and that is what it is, it's a donation, but they're like five million people in their, in their metropolitan areas. It's a totally different economy for them. So um, when you compare us to actual peer cities in the NBA, this is comparable. When you look at our own history, this is a nice bonus. When you look at the fact that if your answer, you know, to that issue is to kind of banish the team to another city, I would argue we still need a new arena. Like, like we are not as competitive in concerts as we deserve to be, and that's going to only get worse. And now we have no one to help us pay for the arena, you know? Um, but kind of the final thing is, this is the offer. This is the deal. And you ultimately have to decide whether you think it's worth it or not. But guess what? My phone is not ringing off the hook with other NBA teams offering more, you know? <laughs> and it's never going to ring off the hook with that offer um, because the, the reality is, we've alluded to it, I mean, the competitor cities that don't have an NBA team that are larger than us mm -hmm. are terrifying. It's Seattle, Las Vegas, Nashville, San Diego, Cincinnati, Jacksonville, Kansas City. I mean, these are much larger metropolitan areas, most of whom have a better arena than the one we currently have, some of whom have a better arena than the one we are even proposing to build. <laughs> Seattle got their act together. They have a billion dollar arena today after they lost the Sonics. Um, it's like, it makes no rational or logical sense why we have a team here, except that we have local owners <laughs> and we have a lease. Yeah. But we're not gonna have a lease much longer and you can't assume you're always gonna have local owners. Yeah. But someday this team's gonna be owned by a hedge fund in New York or a Russian oligarch or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just gonna look at the bottom line and they're gonna go, why wouldn't I go to a much larger market where I can make more money? Yeah. So it's like, at the end of the day, you know, you wanna make that your line in the sand. Well, guess what? The team relocates, moves to a bigger market with a nicer arena, and makes more money. Well, you've really shown them, haven't you, you know? <laughs> but we have lost $600 million in annual economic impact, all the other benefits that Russell was just talking about, um, and we're Amarillo again, yeah. you know? Well, that, who's the winner and who's the loser in that scenario? So it's like, this is a vote on some level for realists. You gotta, like, you gotta understand what your bargaining position is, you got to understand the state of affairs and you got to understand that this is the deal and the deals only get worse from here because if it fails on December 12th, you're in a bidding war with a lot of other cities that we just can't outbid. And we kind of have to use it, put it in terms of, of NBA free agency. We're in an exclusive negotiating phase <laughs> with, a, with a player who is still under contract. But on December 31st, 13th, it's like they become a free agent and boy, I don't want to get into that bidding war. We have an opportunity because this ownership group certainly prefers to be here in Oklahoma City, but they're, you know, they're making an offer that they feel is comparable um, to the other options they have and to the other cities our size. And it is what it is. And you have to decide if it's worth it. When I look at the economic impact of this, and to me it's 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 a no-brainer. $590 million annual economic impact times 30 is obviously a lot more money. I can't do that math, Russell could. <laughs> but it's obviously a lot more money than $50 million more in the, in the arena donation, right? It is truly cutting off your nose to spite your face to get hung up on that issue. You can be mad about it all you want, but you have to vote yes on December 12th because what is at stake here is so much bigger than that. Well, and it's probably too simplistic. I know it's too simplistic, Dr. Evans, to look at that total price tag and then think about 
total economic impact. But some people will do that. They'll say, well, we're going to put out this much. What are we getting back in terms of economic impact? Talk to us a little bit about that and how that, where does that start to be on the positive side for Oklahoma City voters? If they say, we're going to give this much, where does it start to turn in, in the city's favor? Yeah, so first of all, you know, sort of on this conversation, I have to think, and, and this is not my area, this is more John area, John's area, but I, I would have to think that a $50 million investment by the Thunder, and if a new arena gets built, right, the, the opportunities that, to generate revenue from the new arena, that gets capitalized into the valuation of the franchise. That's a net gain for the owners, great. Mm -hmm. A 25 year lease tied to this market is a net drag on the valuation of the franchise, right? So I would think in some ways on the negotiation, there's a little bit of this trade off of saying, I, I wasn't in the room, but I have to imagine there's a little bit of a trade off of, of not only kind of what, what can we get you to volunteer to contribute to an arena, but how long can we get you to stay? And there's a bit of a trade off from an ownership group of those two things sort of working against each other on, on the valuation of a franchise. On, on, the, on the economic impact of the Thunder, I really think about, so think about this, right? We, we keep opening, every time I, I open my news feed these days, I see another urban downtown restaurant that's closing. I see urban retail that's struggling. And we think about an arena and the concerts and the Thunder. One of the economic impacts that I think goes unnoticed a little bit is that it creates a density, sort of a critical mass of foot traffic through some restaurant, retail, entertainment districts that otherwise wouldn't exist. They, they wouldn't be able to be supported otherwise without the presence of the thunder. And so often when we're like we're downtown and we're going out to eat or we have a lunch meeting, I think this restaurant, this district, this area would not be here absent the critical mass that's attracted into the urban district a couple hundred times a year from a concert or an arena activity or a thunder game. And so you start thinking about that economic impact and you start thinking about the dynamic effects. We really, we, we are, as a city, we have, I hear conversations that, that almost take our future urban economic success for granted, mm -hmm. that it's inevitable. And we're actually, it's not. It's actually incredibly fragile. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were very lucky in our timing with the passage of, of the original MAPS package, with a, a sort of a resurgence in the oil and gas industry. We were building major corporations, big structures, big economic activity a lot of those tailwinds aren't there anymore. And so the next, the last five years have been different from the previous 10, and the next 15 will be different than the previous 15. So we're sort of moving into an economic future where the economic impact from that critical mass of, of maintaining your urban development, but also the dynamic effects of the growth, that's going to be more valuable in the next 15 years than it was in the last 15 years, because we don't have some of the same tailwinds that we had mm -hmm over the last 15 years. It's going to be a different, a much more difficult environment for us to sustain robust urban development in Oklahoma City in the next 15 years. And so I think when I think about the vote, those are some of the things that, that when I think about economic impact, that's how I sort of frame it, think about it in my mind. John, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Evans mentioned the uh, the team and sort of the numbers that they have to be crunching. And uh, Mr. Mayor, you've used the idea of, we're not in the junior NBA, <laughs> we're not yeah. in the JV NBA, the right. salaries, the money that the, the team needs to have at its disposal to build a contender, and looks like they're on the verge of being in that ballpark again. What are some of the calculations that you think the team has to be considering as it looks at the future, an arena, all those sorts of things? Yeah, you know, uh, in case people haven't noticed, the Thunder have a very young, exciting team that is going to become very expensive one day. Yeah. And, you know, granted, you, can ne you can't guarantee that we're just going to give all these guys max contracts, they're going to be happy, but still, there's a good core to work with there that is going to get very expensive. Now, there's a big uh, there's a big TV deal coming up that's obviously going to benefit everyone across the league. Um, you know, local TV deals are in flux, but that's something that's going to be ironed out as well. And, you know, the, the local revenue that can be generated at a place like Paycom Center, as opposed to a larger arena, just with more amenities and you know more uh, ability to draw people in, get people in to watch the games, you know all those things really matter, and so that is a part of the equation. Right. You know, granted, all of the national TV deals are a huge chunk of that, but still, getting those people to come in day in day out, not only coming to the arena, but then supporting the nearby businesses, um, I can definitely see myself just being in this space for a few years, how much it has changed, how much it's revitalized, and even talking to some people. You know, how's business? Business is great during the NBA season. Mm. You get those sort of comments, and business was not this good 10 years ago. Um, you know, those factors, when you combine it all together, outside of the thunder, you start to see how this matters. Yeah. Can I jump yeah. in on that real quick? Because like, 
we haven't gotten into it in that, and he alluded to it. The arena, I mean, the reason that the team and concert promoters are going to want us to have a newer and bigger arena is very much tied to revenue. It's not just like, I think it should look nicer. I mean, it is, it is about size, first of all, and primarily. Um, we have an arena that's like 550,000 square feet. Most NBA arenas are 750,000 square feet, and some are a million, which means they're almost twice as big as ours. And a lot of times, I, every time I say size, I qualify and I say by square footage, and yet everybody always hears seating capacity. So I'm just going to keep hammering it home. I am not <laughs> talking about seating capacity. That's yeah. fine. Um, no, what happens is the revenue that you make in that building is often happening outside of the bowl in a modern arena. Um, and this may not have even been as true when we built ours 20 years ago, but like now it's like all this hospitality activity, all this retail and dining activity is happening outside of the bowl and you need room for that. And, and space is like kind of the hardest thing to just fix. You know, you can't just like really just make your arena 50% larger, right? So that's why you start over and that's why we've done it. This would be the third time we've started over in this city. Um, you have to kind of take a quantum leap forward. So that's why we need an arena. It does directly tie to the economics of doing business here and making the team ultimately competitive because they need money to pay those max salaries. Um, but when you're, that's one thing they can affect. They can't make the city bigger. Bigger cities mean two things, more people to buy tickets and more corporations to buy suites and, and probably just more wealth that can pay even more for tickets. Um, and also the local TV deal, which is one of the biggest differentiators. We don't talk about it a lot, but it's one of the biggest differentiators to being a, a, a team in a market like ours is, you know, I'm just making these numbers up, but it's like the Lakers are getting 100 million and we're getting two, you know, and yeah. like, it's great that everybody gets to share the ESPN contract, but the local TV deals are different. Yeah. And when people say, and they have lately, because it's a whole other thing. We do a whole show on like the TV con local TV <laughs> contract right now. But people say, well, the game should just be free on TV, like on broadcast. And I'm like, I'm all for that as a fan. But I also know like you're, you're, you're going to get to watch free games of a losing team because like <laughs> you do need your, if you want your team to win, you yeah. want your team to make some money because that is how they play players. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely absolutely. so. So this $900 million price tag that's on the arena, Arenas have, to have traditionally run over on price. Is there some overrun uh, flexibility within that 900 million, or what happens if sure. this ends up being a more expensive building than that? Well, as the letter of intent that we signed with the team, publicly voted and is on our website, states, um, you know, this is the only revenue source. Th this plus, we didn't get into the details, but you know, this the six year one cent sales tax, which doesn't raise taxes because it takes effect after the MAPS 4 tax expires. Um, plus the 70 million from MAPS 4, which was already allocated for downtown arena, plus the 50 million from the team. That's it. In the past, you know, in public venues, when we've constructed things and, you know, maybe something comes in a little more expensive than we thought, the, the marble goes to, becomes linoleum. I mean, you just, you make some cuts, yeah. you know? I mean, there, there's not another, uh, I'm not saying we always try to get creative. We find some quarters in the cushions of the couch or something here and there, but yeah. I've heard people say, oh, this is obviously going to be 1.5. I'm sorry, it is not. <laughs> unless, unless, uh, unless somebody else is paying for that. But we don't have that kind of money. And uh, it was understood to, to be considered credible in this experience. We needed to have a minimum of $900 million, but there's, there's not much more beyond that that we can, that we can really go. Dr. Evans, one of the things that Mayor Holt mentioned, obviously, is that square footage, which I think a lot of people want to know, what does that mean beyond just NBA? Is the anticipation more concerts, more shows, and what could that mean for, you know, just the dynamics and the economics downtown? Yeah, so, so definitely, I think that's the expectation. I think, it, you know, and, and I may be wrong here. I'm sort of an outsider on this on, on on some of this conversation, but it feels to me like the proposal is to build a new arena. But in my mind, it's almost like the proposal is to build the first, our first real NBA right. quality, like first class arena, yeah. right? And so, it, it, so that's kind of where I sort of think about it. And, and, then, and then to attract some of, the, uh, some of the concerts and some of the additional activity, I think that's actually bigger than some people think. Uh, when you look at sports tourism impacts, right, a lot of recent reports on sports tourism impacts at professional and amateur levels, that's a big deal in Oklahoma City. When you think about some of the uh, tourism impacts from uh, music and concerts and events, that's a big deal. When people come for one a tourist activity, I'm sure we all did the same thing. You travel to one city for one activity and you find yourself doing multiple activities in that city. Um, and so, you know, that spills over, uh, you know, pretty quickly. 
And then I think a piece of this that I think is kind of interesting is there's a pretty um, remarkable correlation between acts of creativity and economic growth and entrepreneurship. And I think, I think to the extent that we can create a network and the arena would be there with some smaller venues in and around the downtown area, to the extent that you can create kind of a creative sector, whether it's in music or arts or other areas, it actually like spills over into entrepreneurship and innovation and new economic activity. And so I think it's kind of the, the opportunity to bring uh, you know, a big concert venue here paired with some of the other neat venues that we have popping up right now. I think, again, dynamic effects that are, are, are pretty significant. John, I want to ask about NBA arenas that are bigger, better in a second, but that, mm -hmm. what Dr. Evans said begs a question of Paycom Center, the current arena, if we're thinking about maybe building something onto a, a new arena. Is there a plan for, for Paycom at this point for, for anything right no, now? I just tell people that's the last domino to fall in all this. That that becomes our second arena like seven years from now. Yeah. And it's just best to probably keep an open mind as long as you can. If you'd have had Mayor Cornette sitting here 10 years ago and you'd asked him, hey, what do you think is going to happen to the Cox Convention Center? I guarantee you he wasn't going to say it'd be a film studio, yeah. you know, so who knows? Right. Um, I think that's best for you know, future, it's not that far in the future, but for future conversations okay. to decide what's best for it. And one other thing I want to add to what Russell said, we're one of only two cities, two NBA cities, that are playing in an arena that was built before we got an NBA team. So there is such an opportunity here to really finally have an NBA arena. Yeah. Um, you could look at the last 15 years and the fact that we basically got all of that with an expenditure of about $200 million as like, we came out so far ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> in that deal that maybe we should keep that in mind as we move forward. Yeah, John, I did want to ask, you know, as it relates to, we, we obviously don't know exactly what this arena will look like, feel like, but you've been to other places, like Dr. Evans said, and, and I think the mayor has referenced it as well. Paycom was built to get a hockey team. It's yep. not an NBA arena. Right. What could fans expect to look, feel? How is, how is a new arena that is like some of these other new arenas? What's, what's the expectation of how it could be different for the fan experience? Yeah, you know, uh, obviously we've made some improvements to Paycom Center uh, along the way, adding a giant scoreboard. As you, if you've been in the arena lately, um, you know, that helps you know, with the experience. But, you know, I, I've you know, read about like the Gamebridge Fieldhouse in Indiana. Just the way the seats are structured, it's more of a, you know, you're sort of on top of the floor. It's, it's a different, it's a more immersive experience. And, you know, the one thing that I've heard about the current Paycom Center, it was built with hockey in mind, just the way the seats are laid out and they just redid all of those. But I think there would be just a different structure, a different viewing experience of the game. And then again, being able to, you know, have a whole lot more going on in the concourses than there is right now. Um, it, you just go to these other arenas, they're just, they're just, a lot more activity going on, a lot more options, you know, when you're taking your family out to these games. So, um, Paycom Center has served Oklahoma City very well, you know, but uh, I, I think it's a great point that um, it's, you know, the Thunder have, I don't want to say they've gotten by, but they've made really good use out of it. And, you know, the next generation of arenas, Oklahoma City is one of many cities that is going to be in line to to, to have the next generation arena in their city. Well, some of these, go well, ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, like, you go to these other cities, where you go to the Barclays in Brooklyn or Chase in San Francisco or Fiserv in Milwaukee, and, I mean, it just takes 10 seconds. I mean, you look up and you go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it's supposed to look like. I mean. And that's an amazing legacy opportunity for this generation to like really raise the bar in the city aesthetically and experientially to have this building because it will be like twice as tall and twice as wide and just magnificent. And I know the Thunder and the city are both really determined to have it be a statement aesthetically for our community. It really will make you proud. And yeah. I'm excited for that opportunity. Things like going to a concession stand and still being able to see the action on the floor. Right. I mean, little yeah. things like that that will change <laughs> the experience for fans. Before we get to sort of a final word for voters, I wanted to ask about one more component of this. And that's the community benefits agreement that is part of this potentially, um, you know, a higher base pay for arena workers, hiring from some of the lower, uh, the city's most economically challenged uh, zip codes for arena jobs. Why was this important, uh, Mayor mm -hmm. Holden, and Dr. Evans, sort of what what could, what could impact could that have? Uh, sure, I, I, I credit Councilman Cooper yeah. working with, um, you know, some community interests that were, were focused on this, people like Tim O'Connor with uh, with our local unions. And, um, you know, we, we passed this as a council on the same day that we called for the election. And it, and it does just the things you described. And, uh, 
you know, I, I think that's great. And uh, I think it was easy for the council to support ultimately, but it, it was good that we were able to actually have the conversation and make it a part of this. And um, I think that uh, that has been appealing to people who, you know, have reservations for whatever reason, um, you know, to, to see and be reminded, you know, that a lot of people um, at all socioeconomic levels make their make their careers at that building, you know, and, and collect incomes at that building. Um, it's not just billionaires <laughs> using that space, you know. Um, it's, it's hundreds, if not thousands of people who depend on what happens there. And uh, if we can make sure they're fully taken care of, I think that was what the intent and motivation behind that was. Yeah, yeah. and certainly right now, you know, we're in a, we're in a tight labor market uh, as it is, and so, uh, finding the help that you would need for a project of this scale will be will be difficult in this environment. You don't know what the environment's going to be in when you when you go to construction, um, when you start really uh, taking on your your biggest hires. And so, uh, I think it's going to be a way to to really bridge, connect the community to the project itself. Right. So, okay, well, let's look in the backyard of the arena. Let's look at the backyard of the community and make sure that those communities. Uh, are benefiting both from the construction, but then from the operations of the arena, and really tie place. Use the use the arenas for place making to tie the arena to the place and to the communities around it. I think the last thing I'll say on on the on the price tag is we've had the opportunity to work with the city on a couple of uh, budgeting for maps projects. We're pretty good at projecting what collections will be over a six or seven year period. We've never had a MAPS experience where the MAPS collections came in short of the budgets. There was always a little bit of, of cushion in the collections. The one thing I'm, I'm most confident in, I always tell people in, in this whole conversation, is I'm confident that, that the six year one cent sales tax makes the 900 million project affordable. That part I'm confident yeah, in, because we've done, we've done that analysis enough times in enough different ways, that, that's not an issue that I'm concerned about. In many ways, the track record of the city and its leaders in doing these kind of projects, I think should be a, a, a positive for voters because of some of what yeah. you said. We've done this enough in this city, we sort of know what's yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. All right, before we get out of here, I want to do one last word for voters. We'll start with John and go this way. What's the last word you want to give to voters as they prepare to go to the polls on December 12th? You know, the, the one thing that I keep saying, and, and Mayor Holt kind of tipped it off, it is very Thunder-centric, and we're in the, we're on a sports space, so obviously we're geared to think that way, uh, but it is about a lot more entertainment options that, again, it just becomes a, a hub for activity in the downtown area. Um, there's a lot of concerts that unfortunately skip Oklahoma City and go to Tulsa that I would love to go to, uh, that uh, maybe that they will be able to come to Oklahoma City. So, you know, it's bigger than the Thunder. The Thunder are, you know, ideally 50-ish nights a year. That's 300 plus for other events. And, um, you know, so I think if you could think beyond that a little bit, understand it's not all about them. They're a big component being a tenant of the building, but it's much bigger than that. Yeah, I think my final word would be just, you know, trust your own experience, right? I would say, you know, this is not a new tax, so you know what the, you know what it feels like to pay the tax. You know what it's like to have a team and not have a team. You know what it's like to live in a high amenity city and a low amenity city. And so there's a lot of noise out there. I would just tell, I always tell my my, my friends, just sort of trust your own experience. You, you are so well informed for this vote. <laughs> trust your own experience, trust your own information, ignore some of the noise, and uh, I think you'll be just fine. I'm going to assume most of the people watching or listening to this are probably in favor. And I think what I'd say to them is have a sense of urgency, take that extra step. If you can vote Thursday or Friday this week at the Oklahoma County Election Board, do that, get it out of the way. Make sure you get it done. Um, but whatever it is, you know, call somebody, email somebody, post on social media. Um, just don't take it for granted. And also recognize, like, there's some benefit here in running up the score a little bit too, you know? I mean, I want to make a statement to the country that we're not going anywhere because I guarantee you, everybody else, does not think that we should have this team and does not think that we're the city that we believe ourselves to be, mm -hmm. even after these 15 years of having the thunder. Um, and, you know, being able to pass this and hopefully pass it by an overwhelming majority, we'll, we'll say, no, this is America's 20th largest city and we plan to stay there. And so let's, let's make a statement to the world about who Oklahoma City is and who we aspire to continue being. And uh, let's get out and vote on December 12th. Well, I can't thank each of you enough for the insight that you've shared today with sellout crowds, listeners, viewers, readers. Just a reminder again that that election for the Oklahoma City voters will be held Tuesday, December 12th, one week from today. 
Polls are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. As the mayor mentioned, you can vote early this week, so check into that if that's something that fits better with your schedule. We encourage everyone, no matter how you feel, to get out and vote and participate in this important decision. Sellout Crowd will continue to cover the election and the thunder. Keep following us at selloutcrowd.com. And thanks for watching.